So um, thank you for joining us. Welcome and welcome back to those of you who've been to our previous webinars. Um, it's the third episode of Patient Engagement Travels. My name is Estelle. I'm a patient myself and I work at Infinity Communications. We are a health communications agency based in Geneva, Switzerland, and we are keen to help people learn about patient engagement. That's everybody, patients, people who work with patients, and anybody who's just curious. Um, so today we are meeting a powerful pair of two very accomplished women who've been working in this area of fair pay for patient engagement. We'll hear about how they work together on some really useful tools, including the PFMD um, Fair Patient Engagement Planner, which was actually just uh, launched in April this year. At the end of the webinar, we will have a poll and we will also, afterwards, we'll email you some um, links to the resources that we mentioned during the webinar. So first, let me welcome Nicole Wickey, who is Program Director at Patient Focused Medicines Development. And in this exchange, she represents the topic expert on um, fair patient engagement. And um, as we have in each webinar, I had a topic expert and a patient expert. So welcome, Nicole, and please tell us a little bit more about yourself. Great. Thanks, Estelle. Really happy to be here today. Um, as Estelle mentioned, I'm a program director with PFMD or Patient Focused Medicines Development, um, where we really work to make patient engagement a systematic reality. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm a Swiss Canadian. I'm based in Switzerland. Um, I have experience working in patient advocacy in the pharmaceutical industry, also with patient organization with MPE. So really happy to be here today with Katie um, and also have been at PFMD for the last three years. Um, so I myself, I'm a breast cancer survivor and I'm really passionate about reducing barriers to patient engagement, especially when it comes to um, really practical enablers to just enhance patient engagement, especially with pharmaceutical companies, building trust and tackling different legal and compliance barriers. So happy to be here today and speak to you about our work. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, we're going to hear some really, you know, key words throughout the webinar, uh, practical tools, trust, um, enabling, and um, PFMD, which we've introduced. MPE, we're going to introduce now as we are um, welcoming Katie Joyner to the webinar as our speaker, and she is co-chief uh, executive officer at Myeloma Patients Europe, and she's representing the patient voice in this webinar. So welcome, Katie, and um, please tell us if this, uh, what else would you like people to know about you today? Thanks, Estelle. Um, very happy to be here and presenting alongside Nicole. Um, as Estelle mentioned, I'm Katie Joyner. I'm the co-chief executive officer at Myeloma Patients Europe. Um, for those who aren't familiar with myeloma, it's a rare blood cancer, and we are an umbrella organization comprised of 49 patient groups across 31 countries. Um, our mission is to provide education and support for our members and to advocate for the best treatment and improved access to medicines across Europe. Um, a little bit about me, I'm originally from the United States, but I'm based in Munich for the past three and a half years. Um, Prior to joining MP, I was um, working in nonprofit organizations in the United States for the autism community. And in my role at MP, I um, do a lot of work with our pharmaceutical partners to um, ensure meaningful and effective um, patient engagement. And so a big part of that is also the legal and compliance and contracting and payment processes. So I feel really strongly about um, all of the aspects that go into improving the patient engagement process and looking forward to discussing some of the tools and some of the experiences that we've had at MP over the past uh, several years. Thanks, Katie. That's brilliant. Um, okay, so before we go um, forward and explore the tools that you and Nicole uh, have contributed to, I wanted to ask this question that you, you know, sometimes hear and over and over, which is, um, should patients actually be involved uh, paid for their time and involvement in projects. What do you think of this, Katie? 
So from my perspective, and I know there's a lot of um, debate around how this can be done well, from my perspective, the question of whether or not patients should be paid is a moot point. It's an obsolete question. Um, and this is really due to the tireless efforts of advocates who have come long before me to make sure that the um, pharmaceutical companies understand the value and the um the value and the uh, use of, of patient input and that this work should absolutely be paid. So it's great that we've gotten to a place where we can all agree that patients should be paid. The challenge now is how can we do this better? How can we do this in a more fair way? How can we do this in a more transparent way? So, um, you know, it's there's definitely been progress over the past several years, but there's a lot of work to do, which is where the tools um, come into play that we'll talk about in a bit. So I think, um, it's like I said, it's great that we're at a place of agreement, but where things start to get murky is the steps around getting those contracts in place and getting that payment processed. So, you know, we're seeing contracts that are way too cumbersome for patients, way too long, too much legalese, include a lot of maybe unfair requirements or burden on a patient organization or an individual patient, lack of transparency around rates, um, lack of clarity from the beginning of the contracting process. I've seen instances of companies refusing to work with certain countries or markets because their internal compliance um, processes are too cumbersome for themselves. So then you're silencing or not involving patients from certain areas where their input would be valued, but their own legal and compliance processes essentially prevent it. So how can we get to a better place and what tools do we need um, as advocates, as patients, as patient representatives to improve this process for, for everyone and most importantly for the patients? I mean, what's very striking in, um, in these exchanges between patients and um, especially pharmaceutical companies is the resources they have in that, you know, the patient could be an individual, just a little person, you know, all by themselves, or they could come through an organization like yours representing so many patient groups and countries. Um, but even then, they will not, almost certainly will not have the same um, kind of legal resources as a pharmaceutical company who have these, you know, departments that handle you know, legal and compliance issues and their lawyers and their, you know, they've got like big muscle there. So it's, it's important to have things in place that um, can support uh, patients who don't have that behind them. Um, okay, so we have this uh, baseline in place for this webinar that we are saying that patients should be paid. And um, we're talking for the moment in the context of um, with pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. So um, in, this, in this setting, where can patients go and where can pharma companies go if they're looking for uh, some kind of contract, some sort of template to uh, use and uh, adapt? Yeah, so I'll first just kind of reflect on the, the comment you said. It's um, it's a huge burden on patients. They do not have you know legal backgrounds. I mean, of course, some some patients and some organizations do, but that's definitely not um, the the typical uh, you know patient experience. So you're talking about huge pharmaceutical companies with giant legal and compliance teams, and then an individual patient who's maybe never reviewed a contract before, or a small patient organization with very limited resources and time, um, and perhaps no expertise there, either um, attempting to negotiate this and understand these contracts um, in a way that's clear and that we can adhere to the needs of both um, the, the pharmaceutical requirements and the um, patient side. And we recognize that there are huge considerations on the pharmaceutical side. They have, you know, confidential information they need to protect. There are specific laws and requirements of working with patients and commercial interests and things like that that need to be um, followed. So we, you know, we're not ex expecting that um, the pharmaceutical company is not going to follow those rules. It's just how can we make this so it's not a burden on patients and so it's clear for, for everyone involved. So, um, to respond to this very clear need from the patient community, several years ago, um, 
Myeloma Patients Europe, um, actually when Nicole was here, so she was a, a key member of launching this project internally at MPE in collaboration with WECAN, which is the work group of European Cancer Patient Advocacy Networks, and um, now in collaboration with PFMD, recognized a need for tools and resources for the patient community and developed a series of um, guiding principles and template agreements uh, for patients and patient organizations to use to help support their work um, when, when negotiating and getting paid and contracting with pharmaceutical companies. So um, the guiding principles are extremely helpful. I still use them today. They are um, a, a document that kind of breaks down the different parts of a contract that you would, would expect to receive from a company and tells you in clear lay language, you know, what is a what is this confidentiality clause that I'm reading in a contract mean? Why is it important to patients? Why is it important to the company? What are some examples of um, how we might be in breach of this contract? What do we need, we need as a patient organization to consider when reviewing this contract? And it provides sample language for, again, these kind of big pain points for, for companies and for um, patient organizations to consider so that you have you know, a foundation of knowledge if you've never had any legal um, training or background to start reviewing these contracts from an informed place. Um, and then the templates are uh, an example of a contract that a patient organization or a patient uh, or advocate or carer could use with a pharmaceutical company for typical um, activities like an advisory board or um, a consultancy or some other activity. And it provides, you know, again, um, clauses that would follow a typical um, contract that you would receive from a pharmaceutical company, but written in language that was, um, you know, helped developed by legal experts, but also the patient community. So it's written clearly, it's written with um, our needs in mind, and it's meant to be, again, a starting point to negotiate these contracts. The idea was not that, you know, a, a giant corporation would copy and paste these contracts and start using them, but if you're having trouble kind of negotiating around the, um, the liability clause, let's look at the global principle or the guiding principles. Let's look at the template agreement and see if we can modify this. So it's fair for both sides and also clear for both sides. So that was really the intent of these documents. And now um, you can find them on um, several, you know, online at PFMD at WeCan. And there's also training from WeCan um, on how to apply these principles. Um, and they're also looking at additional uh, legal training um, as there continues to be a need for this from the patient community side. That's awesome that these are freely available and so much work and expertise has, has gone into them. Um, and then, um, I mean, my question is, okay, so we've been talking a lot about pharmaceutical companies, uh, sponsors as they're called, um, who do need to engage with patients in many different ways. Uh, but how, um, how does this work for other parties who would like to engage with, with patients like, I don't know, nonprofits or startups or say just researchers at a university um, who don't work for pharmaceutical companies? Could they use these tools? Could a patient who is approached by them say, oh, I heard about this, um, this WeCan, um, MPE, PFMD tools and um, principles and templates, would that be a possibility? Yes, absolutely. So while, you know, we did develop them, um, or they were developed, you know, primarily for pharmaceutical interactions, because that is the majority at the time of where the need was, they can be applied um, really and adapted to any situation, which is their intent. So I personally have used these with um, universities, with researchers, with um, communications companies, um, and the language exists to be modified and used for the need of the interaction. So I think it's um, it's a great tool to as a starting point. And oftentimes with those smaller entities that might not have a huge um, legal and compliance team or specific templates already developed, we've used the the template in its entirety, of course, again, adapted for the, um, the, the interaction, but there's been very few changes that have needed to happen with the existing templates when I'm using them with some of these um, smaller or, um, you know, smaller organizations like a, like a third party communications company or something like that. And they're much more willing to, to use them as is, which is makes the whole process much um, easier for both sides. Yeah, that's brilliant. I can imagine one could also spend uh, a lot of time kind of going backwards and forwards on these uh, templates before you can actually get to 
really starting the work, which is the really you know the fun and interesting part. Um, okay, so there's been a lot of uh, good works done by by the likes of you on setting up good practice, which is perhaps not best practice, but it can be adapted um, according to to the situation. Uh, you know, when we were preparing for this webinar, you said something that really stayed with me, and you said. Uh, that a patient consultant is not a boxed up profession. Um, and I thought about that. And I thought, what is a boxed up profession? And I thought, you know, what is it that like most people around the world could say, I know what that is. And I thought like a dentist, we all more or less know what is a dentist? What do they do? Um, that it's, you know, a four to whatever, six years more or less to become a dentist. Um, and we know what we're gonna get when we go to the dentist pretty much. But with a patient a consultant, you really, um, there's such a wide range of expertise in diseases, in um, exposure to different kinds of patient engagement. Um, and so it is not boxed up. It's really um, each patient will come with their own kind of set of um, skills and expertise and experience and so on. And, and this, the fact that it's not boxed up could kind of lead to a lot of um, mismatched expectations, potentially um, difficulties in the relationship in these kind of consultations. Um, so, I mean, what I wanted to ask you now, like in practical terms, in reality, there are, are pharma employees looking at these contracts and, and um, principles and proposing them? I mean, can, you, can you talk about what it's like for them that, from your experience? Sure. And I'll, you know, the point you touched on in terms of the range of expertise and skills um, is, I think, really where what Nicole's going to talk about with the Fair Patient Engagement Planner really comes into play, because I think um, throughout this process, we saw an immediate need for support around contracting and payment. But what the, the Patient Engagement Planner does is kind of take an even earlier step to improve this process even uh, before we get to the contracting phase and to reduce a lot of that lack of clarity around how the engagement works. So I, I won't take any of Nicole's um, talking points because she'll go into it in detail, but I think that's that piece is kind of missing from the the legal agreements because um, we weren't thinking that you know far ahead um, or that early in the process. So <clears throat> from the legal agreement side, you know, we do have a good examples of this in practice. Um, and you can see on the screen, um, MP's former CEO and, and current board member, Ananda Plate, who was, um, you know, instrumental in this project at MP, and um, Wafa Araki, who works in the patient engagement um, lead in, in myeloma at Janssen, um, presented on this recently at Reuters and, um, and the Pharmaceutical uh, Congress about the work they did to push these um, improved templates through uh, Janssen so that the contracting process um, in patient engagement with myeloma would be improved. So we have examples of that um, at Janssen, at Servier, I'm sure several companies across other disease areas and indications have um, been able to improve their processes internally, whether they're using the templates directly or not. You know, in my experience, I'm seeing this process get better with every headache we find, uh, you know, the next time gets a bit easier, but it really takes I think an internal champion um, to help push this through. Again, you're talking about huge legal and compliance teams that are, their job is to make sure the company is protected and that they're following the rules and the laws and making sure that things are um, in place as they need them to be. And if they are quite removed from patient engagement, which is still new for a lot of companies and what that actually means, um, there's a lack of understanding of what it entails and why a contracting process with a patient or a patient organization is not going to look the same as a contracting process with a vendor or a CRO or, or a market research agency or something like that. And I think it really takes a lot of internal, internal advocacy and internal education to explain why you can do this in a better way that's faster, that's fairer, that's clearer, um, and better for everyone involved. But it's not an overnight situation. I think it really takes someone internally at a company to push it through. Um, and also why it's really important when these tools are being developed that they include pharmaceutical representatives on the steering committee so that they have early buy-in in this, um, which was done with both of these projects. And um, hopefully through, you know, trial and error, you can get to a place where we do have better templates and faster contracting and better contracting um, with companies. But it it's certainly a, a process and something that still has a lot of, I think, room for improvement. 
Yeah. Um, and this will all lead to really promoting better relationships between patients and pharmaceutical companies, um, increasing uh, the trust. Absolutely. Founded on, on documents and conditions that have been agreed upon and understood from both sides. Um, yeah, I was at that um, Reuters conference at that presentation, and it was so um, exciting to see something being co-presented by a patient and by a, um, a pharmaceutical company employee, and to see how many patient engagement managers there were there who were kind of really interested and wanting to know how does this work, what can I do, where can I go for tools, and to be inspired by their peers, because the you know as we know the value of peer to peer. Um, uh, learning is so is so high. Um, okay, so um, so what we keep hearing over and over is that things need to be the fair, uh, reasonable, and transparent. And this seems like a good mo moment for me to ask you, Nicole, to tell us a bit about um, the PFMD work, the Fair Remuneration Project. Great, hey, thanks. Um, yeah, happy to talk to you about the Fair Remuneration Project. So um, this was something that we set out to collaborate on really building on the um, legal agreements work that, um, that we did together with WECAN and MPE. Um, so really focusing there on very comprehensively the different clauses in, in legal agreements, but then in particular realizing that remuneration itself just was continually a pain point and just feeling a little bit like a, a black box. And there were some different principles that had been, been published by different groups, but always a, a feeling like those were not necessarily being recognized or implemented or even really well known um, across the patient engagement ecosystem. Um, so we really wanted to elaborate that remuneration piece and develop comprehensive overarching global principles that would really um, create commonly agreed co-created global standards um, and really driving change and good practice. So this project was led by a steering committee that had representatives from the patient community and pharmaceutical companies, including, uh, including Katie. Um, and throughout this project, we had um, bit by bit created different elements around fair remuneration and held public consultations and patient engagement open forum sessions, um, just to really try to bring people along with us and consult and get their input and feedback so they could feel like part of the process of fine tuning and refining the work. So through that process, we had consulted with well over a thousand different members of the patient engagement community. So the real initial focus of the project was on the global remuneration principles. Um, those really harmonized um, previous collaborative work on the topic from, um, from different actors in the patient engagement ecosystem. You, you would have seen them on the bottom of the previous slide. Um, but then in addition to that, we really wanted to also operationalize those um, to bring those core principles off the page um, and make them a little bit easier for people to apply in practice. So uh, it's a, been a big undertaking and about two years worth of work, but really happy with where we're at today. And we can already see the, the wheels of change are, are turning. That's impressive. And I mean, when you hear multi-stakeholder collaboration, uh, I don't know what number comes to people's minds, but I was very impressed to hear that it was as many as a thousand um, voices that helped form these, these tools. Um, so tell us a little bit more about these principles. They're up here on the screen so the viewers can see them. Um, because we, this is another thing that keeps coming back. They seem to be really the foundation of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. We really set out to have something that was comprehensive and always a balance of feedback because <laughs> those thousand people, half uh, 500 would maybe want that things are far more simplified um, and the others really are craving to have context and examples. Um, so we've come away with uh, 14 really comprehensive principles um, and they cover the really key areas of remuneration that you see on your screen such as the right to remuneration, what's involved when we say fair remuneration, the right to refuse remuneration, for instance, um, about fairly paying um, expenses, about agreeing on payment terms, and what best practice should look like uh, in those instances. 
So one thing we really wanted to focus on in this project was um, trying to activate those principles so that they're not just the lovely PDF on a website, but rather that we could really support patient engagement pro partners to apply these in their day-to-day -day work and their interactions. So we found that one principle in particular that falls under principle two, fair remuneration. Um, it's, it's commonly found in different codes of conduct and in different uh, pharmaceutical industry codes. And that stipulates that fair remuneration um, ought to take into account the activity and therefore the complexity of the task and the expertise that's required for that task or activity. Um, and in speaking across PFMD members and different pharmaceutical companies, and also the experience of patient engagement um, or patient organizations and, um, and individual patients, is that that was not really being operationalized very well, uh, if at all. Um, so we really wanted to focus in on developing some complementary tools and frameworks that could operationalize that particular piece. So we worked together to develop um, an activity framework that was adapted from some earlier work from the National Health Council, really trying to come up with a comprehensive yet succinct list of the most common engagements between pharma companies and patient communities, and also an expertise framework where we had built on some um, competency um, charts developed in the IMI Paradigm Project to really see, okay, what are the key expertise areas and how can we differentiate then the level of expertise in those different um, expertise domains, such as you know, market access and health technology assessment expertise or communication expertise, um, the degree of representativeness that, um, that an activity might require um, or um, and degree of, of expertise when it comes to regulatory affairs. So really elaborating those different elements into some frameworks that we could then apply in a digital tool that we launched in April, as you mentioned, Estelle. Thanks, Nicole. I'm imagining, you know, I have this picture in my head of like the paving stones have been laid by um, the principles and now you have this kind of scaffolding of um, an activity framework and expertise framework um, and that's where you can like start building I had this kind of building a picture in my head um, so okay so tell us a bit more about um, how the principles feed into the fair patient engagement planner I'm going to put a slide up so people can determine uh, distinguish these uh, names right. uh, it's exactly like you said uh, Estelle it was really like um, looking at the, the architecture drawings. So trying to elaborate these frameworks, but it's difficult to do that without just putting it into practice and just giving it a shot and testing it out. Um, so we had public consultations to refine these things, uh, as much input to these things as, as humanly possible at the time. Um, and then realized we really need to pull these together into a very easy to use digital tool that can empower um, both patient communities and pharma companies to really effectively apply those principles, really bringing to life those frameworks in a couple simple clicks. Um, so the Fair Patient Engagement Plan are launched in April. So again, it's a really practical tool um, that really brings to life the, the work of the project and it just helps partners to really effectively define their patient engagements. So um, in terms first of the activity that's on the table, so for instance, is it a group engagement like an advisory board, um, uh, speaking engagement, um, reviewing materials. So selecting first what that activity is and inputting a additional context about what might be involved, what are the objectives, what's the purpose, so on. And then moving to the next step and defining, okay, for this activity, the expertise that's that's required for this activity is um, according to the selection that you can input into the tool um, to really define what that expertise profile for the activity would look like. Um, so it's a couple simple steps to just input that information. Um, and then it really then provides you with a very comprehensive summary report 
that can one, like Katie said, take you right to the beginning of making sure that we're setting up this engagement and that we agree on for this activity, what does the ideal expertise profile look like? Um, but also, so just from a good practice and patient engagement perspective and also facilitating um, effective participant matching, finding the right person for the job, but then other elements in the summary report will really talk you through bit by bit and step by step, more so like a discussion guide, core aspects of the global remuneration principles. So that you can be sure to really between partners discuss these um, critical aspects. So if a company, let's say, has a fair market value range, um, does the rate that they're that they're potentially offering for an activity maybe need to be adjusted in light of the expertise that is required for that activity. Is this an extremely short notice activity with a lot of urgency behind it? Um, really bit by bit talking through core elements of the principles and making sure that you're having just open and transparent dialogue about those aspects. Um, really building trust together and breaking down that black box of fair remuneration. So one other thing that I could mention about the tool is that verified patient community users can access not only the summary report that provides you the summary of the activity and the expertise needed and the different um, fair remuneration considerations to be discussed with partners, but there's also a benchmarking portion of the tool for those patient community users. Um, there you can access the median fair market value rate for your country of residence or the country where your patient organization is registered. Um, just to allow you to have a general sense, we heard a lot throughout the project that um, many people in the patient community don't know what they've, what's the ballpark of the fair market value in their country. So really empowering them with that information that can then just really help to bolster that open dialogue between partners. So some those rates might vary very considerably from one company to the next. And the most important thing is that you just openly discuss that together. Some companies have um, an ability to pay at a, at a higher rate than others, just as you would if you had a, a job with a tech company. If you work at Google versus working at a startup, things might look a little bit different. The important thing is just really talking about those things together. So tool is easy to use, it's free to use, it's on the patient engagement signups platform. Um, yeah. Everybody is free to go and look at this and explore it on the on the website. Um, so just you know, one um, last kind of point to wrap this all up because this this webinar series is about where patients go, what they do, the value they bring, who they interact with. So can you tell me, Katie, a little bit about, um, you know, you're representing so many patient groups and countries, 49 patient groups, 31 countries. So your voice is, is a, a, you're carrying thousands of voices in your voice. Can you tell me what kind of value you and MPE and the community behind you um, brought to this work with the Fair Patient Engagement Planner? Sure. So, um, you know, the process was truly, you know, very collaborative from the start. And I think that's why um, PFMD was so successful in getting so many responses during the open consultations. But um, <clears throat> so I joined as on behalf of MPE, and we do have thousands of patients in our network. But more importantly, I was also there to help coordinate input from WeCan, which um, currently has 20 plus umbrella organizations representing diseases um, across hematology and oncology and all of those patients in Europe as well. So collectively, that's thousands of voices and um, a lot of historical experience um, related specifically to this topic. So that was, I think, the key um, point in bringing the patient community perspective into this project um, during the development of the principles and also the activity framework and definition of the expertise areas. So we were able to help facilitate input um, through WeCan and its members, as well as MP, um, on those definitions for expertise, on what the, the, you know, debating some of the principles and how that language should look, the activity framework. And these are advocates who have been um, working with pharmaceutical companies in the very early stages of um, patient engagement you know, decades ago, um, and have really seen firsthand the challenges around um, 
around this process and where the, like I said, the pain points are. And so having, you know, the input from those community members at Weekend, I think was the most valuable um, as part of uh, including the patient voice in this process. And one area I think that we really did help um, shape, um, you know, really directly was the activity framework. You know, when it was first drafted um, with the steering committee, we had the kind of typical, you know, um, advisory board, speaking engagement, reviewing the patient facing materials, things like that. And we can really push us to say, this is, you know, where we've been and where a lot of us are, but where do we want to be? So what are other engagements that we're not seeing as frequently with companies, but that we want to be more involved in? So you know, earlier engagement in research, um, co-development of research design, um, co-authorship of, of publications, things like that, that um, we we aren't maybe as far along as we'd like to be in certain disease areas and with certain companies, but including those in the activity framework, I think is a great reflection of where patient engagement is going and also a good starting point for organizations who might not be working with companies in this capacity yet. But if you're looking at the planner and maybe you're talking about an advisory board, but you're seeing all of these other activities that you could be working on with a company, um, it's a good starting point to say, okay, I see that we're reviewing brochures for you and, and maybe even protocols and ICF forms, but could we also be talking about preclinical research involvement and things like that? Um, so I think that was an area where we really um, pushed and, and helped ensure that that was included. And now you see it reflected directly in the tool. That's really excellent. That would have broadened everybody's horizons on the kinds of patient engagement work that is possible uh, for both sides, presumably. Um, okay, so we, um, we've just got like five, six minutes left for some questions. Um, we've got a question that came in here that says, um, if you represent a patient organization, um, isn't it better to be fair to pay the patients through the patient organization? Also taking into account that a payment could cause a patient representative to lose their benefits in their country. Um, so this question, I guess, is about ways to pay the patient and when the patient can't receive payment for some reason or, or would not like to, perhaps. Yeah. What, what do you, can you talk about these um, aspects? I can, yeah, I didn't touch on this, but I can say from MP's perspective, we um, almost always contract directly with the with the company and pay and we pay the patients. Um, so to avoid the company having to contract directly with the patient, which adds a huge amount of burden on the patient side to review the contracts, et cetera, um, avoid having pharmaceutical companies directly paying patients, um, which can lead to um, you know potential conflicts of interest or other things like that. Um, and it just it streamlines the whole process. It's one contract between MP and a company, and we take care of it. It also keeps the patients um, anonymous um, so that they're not, you know, sending confidential information or personal information in between. And it, it I think the companies typically prefer that. Um, I haven't had a situation in recent years where a companies in any way, most of them, uh, most of the time they're saying it really needs to be through MP. So we find that to be um, the fairest, easiest, and best route. So I absolutely agree. Um, if that's the if that's the option, that that's what we always do. Um, in terms of losing benefits or um, accepting payments and potential ramifications of that, we were talking about that actually right before the webinar. That is could be a consideration. We have had this question before from patients who are retired and receiving social security benefits and could this um, be, could this impact their benefits? And, you know, obviously I'm not an expert in, in social security benefit law across Europe, but it is something to consider, especially depending on the amount of, of perceived income and how you would be, um, you know, reflecting that um, in your in your annual income. So I think it's something patients should be aware of. We haven't run into an issue where a patient had to refuse payment because of that, but it's certainly something uh, patient organizations should be um, aware of and helping their patient representatives, um, you know, figure out what the best option is for them. Mm -hmm. There's also, it's, um, I think those are really comprehensive points, Katie, uh, that you really nailed. But there's a you had touched on it as well. This often comes down to um, there's a preference for companies to also 
contract via a patient organization. Also, since in some countries with their national codes of conduct, it might not be permissible to actually pay an individual patient. Um, it might only be a possibility to contract and provide that remuneration via a patient organization. Um, so the pharma industry uh, um, code of practice in Spain, for instance, is a, is a good example of that, where it's just not, not possible to, um, to contract and pay an individual. Um, so when you, when you are setting up contracts and setting up remuneration, um, and this is something that's also outlined in that um, discussion guide in the Fair Patient Engagement Planner, is that that needs to be really um, discussed up front and agreed. Because um, there's a comment in the, in the Q&A as well. Sometimes people do have a preference to be individually contracted. Um, and the global remuneration principles do state that if it is allowable, according to national codes, regulations, and laws, that that choice of contracting party um, ought to be something that's discussed and agreed up front between partners. So, but again, it comes down to really working in the confines of those, um, those compliance parameters. Um, okay, and then um, one last question. If a company has set rates for paying patients and is unwilling to review or change them, what suggestions would you have for the patient? So we have encountered this situation before. It's happening less and less, which is great. Um, and it hasn't happened recently, but you know, there are situations where we don't feel the rate is fair. So the first thing I do is speak with our um, patient engagement uh, contact. I find that they typically are just as exasperated and just frustrated sometimes by their own internal compliance and legal processes and requirements. And they, you know, it, it's their job to engage with the patient community and we all have a vested interest in, in the engagement activity. So I start with them to see, is there flexibility? What can we do? Can we add additional hours to make up for the lower rate? What are our options here? Um, and we've been able to negotiate and find solutions together. Um, when that's not an option, then you really have to ask yourself, I think, as a patient organization or a patient, is the value of my input um, more important than getting the rate that I feel I deserve? Um, when that has been presented to us, we consider the context, and if we feel that it's more important that the patient voice is included in this project or this, this activity, especially if it's something like a clinical trial protocol or ICF form that could have real impact, we do it because it's important um, more than us getting our rate, but it's certainly a conversation that we have with the company to say going forward, this won't be acceptable, but we're making an exception. Um, and then the third option is to say no and to walk away. Um, we haven't had to do this in, in a long time, which is, I think, a great um, reflection of the progress. But I think it's important for patients and patient organizations to remember the power that they hold. Like I said, it's the company wants our involvement. It's the patient engagement person's job to get that um, input. And if they're not successful, then um, that puts them in jeopardy and it hurts everyone involved if we can't find an agreement that works. So if you feel that the rate is unfair, but also if the process is unfair, was it transparent from the beginning? Was it clear? Were you given enough time? Um, were the expectations fair for you? And then if the rate isn't fair, consider that entire process and say no. And, and there's a lot of power in that. And I think and then it gives you a piece, a place of leverage next time they come to you um, to do it better. And um, hopefully we'll see fewer and fewer examples of those over the years now that we have better um, processes and tools in place to support us. But um, saying no is, is always an option for the patient community. Hmm. That's a very good point. We need to wrap up now. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I think that's an excellent note to end on, that this is also in a very empowering process. Um, for patients is not just about signing complicated co contracts and having to argue over clauses. And there's an increased uh, perception of the need and value for it. And there are many, um, many uh, pharmaceutical representative em uh, employees on this call and on this webinar. I mean, and they're listening, they came to attend today with us. Um, so thank you everybody for being here. And, um, and I would like to encourage you to watch the previous uh, episodes on our YouTube channel as well. Um, and thank you so much to you, Nicole, and to you, Katie, for bringing your expertise 
and for sharing it with us today and for uh, all the amazing preparation. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. So thank you everybody. And please don't forget uh, to stay on the, on the webinar a little bit longer just to quickly take the poll for us because we really value the feedback. Thanks. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.